Hey, Printosters, welcome back to the podcast. It is your host, Bruce from Printavo. We've got a very special guest, not Stephen Farrig, but he is very excitingly a part of this. It has been such a freaking busy whirlwind of the last few months. I, I feel like I've also had to schedule guests so last minute um, we're, to make sure we get things we're done. We're in busy season. It is busy season. We've got a very, very special guest, though, today. Um, they are running a little bit late from the airport, but they're joining soon. We've got Aviant Corporation, uh, and uh, obviously such a big piece of the industry owning, um, you know, Wilflex and Rutland and Union and a bunch of different brands, let alone outside of our industry too. So that's going to be cool, but we'll save that for in a little bit. How's the shop been? Shop's busy. Shop is busy. We kind of were talking about it and we're like fall is here and obviously we work on the academic calendar and uh it's go time until the holidays so things aren't getting easier um but we are i've been in champaign urbana a ton more the last couple of weeks um just because it's it's just it went from like zero to a hundred uh like overnight and it's crazy that it's october already um it's yeah. crazy. I don't know when this comes out, but Print Hustlers is around the corner. Yep, 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 yep. Um, let's see. 22nd minus, we're recording this the 6th, so 15 days, 16 days. So, yeah, super around the corner. It, it is, I, I must say, it is awesome working with uh, Brett and Tom. They've been such a huge help to, like, to just split out work and get things done. Um but yeah, the hotel looks great. We've got it all planned out. Anyway, I'm gonna just jump into the nitty gritty here. Where we can f- small talk that stuff later. But you just got a DTF machine. I did. I got a DTF machine. So uh, yeah, it just got installed yesterday. So um, we have the Cobra Flex. Uh, it's the direct to film printer, and it is powderless. So it is the first powderless really? DTF. Um, and I have model zero, zero, zero. Wait, so powderless though, zero, zero out of 100. So limited edition. Uh, it's the first one. It's the first one in a shop, um, that is running. It was running at, uh, the trade show a couple of weeks ago and, uh, now it's here and we are going to be running it and, uh, we're going to see how it goes. We were doing a bunch of testing last night. Uh, it was fun. Um, we do so much print on demand, decorate on demand, um, art spend on transfers through all the different transfers we buy from across the country, um, is easily over like 25 grand a year. And, uh, Uh with that being said, I was like, I have to have to find something else. And we were talking to Dave at multicraft and and we said, all right, let's do it. So yeah, it's going to be awesome. Was that what prompted it? Um, you know, I, hmm, what prompted it? I was talking to someone, I was talking to Scott Garnett on Facebook. Um, I feel like Scott Garnett, you know, everyone, right. And we were talking about, um, direct to film and, uh, a lot of shops are transitioning the, their DTGs to, um, to going direct to film. And, uh, I was just like looking into it, looking into it, looking into it. And I went down an insane rabbit hole. And I, uh, I started talking to people in the industry that have been using it or know much about it. And one thing led to another. And Dave from Multicraft, who does all of our inks, you know, we get all our Monarch ink. And Dave helped us set up the shop um, with Marcotte back in the day. Was like, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to work with Cobra Flex and let me see what I can do. And that conversation probably ha- happened a month ago. And uh, the text just left yesterday. Um, so today is like my first day with it alone. <laughs> So I was just running. That's hot. And I saw you had uh, Ryan Kasperian too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We had we had Ryan, Ryan came on Monday as well. Um, Ryan's covered in ink, covered in dot ink, um, just for a shop tune up. Work on our production floor for a day with the guys. Every time the guys come out, whether it's Marcotte or Ryan or you know, they just they find a couple things that you never thought were an issue, and you're like, oh, that makes sense now. You know, and for Ryan, he was spending a ton of time in our dark room, really dialing it in with Craigan, which was super cool. So, 
So for direct to film, uh, I just got deeper in at the last trade show just to learn how more specifically it works. For people this, where this is new, can you explain what the what the process is, and especially with the powder aspect, which this doesn't right. require? Right. So. Formally, you can print transfers in your shop, right? You can you can print and there you can print on a film, um, and then there's a powder that kind of goes on. You'll see people like shaking it in a tub or something like that, uh, and that's like the traditional way to print transfers. Um, now, with the transition of ordering transfers, a lot of people in the industry like we still rely on Supercolor very heavily, FM Expression, Six One Eight, all of those. Um, for bringing in transfers so we could do masks, right? So when masks hit, the easiest way to decorate a mask was really a transfer. And so that kind of sparked my interest in the transfer world is why are we printing three color sleeves on 25 pieces? Let's just order transfers. The quality of it is, is amazing. So um, with the kind of evolution of technology, effectively what's happening is the printer is laying down CMYK ink Right, so that print head mm-hmm. is no different than your DTG, and then it's laying down white ink, so that's effectively your underbase, and that's the second print mm-hmm. head, and then the third print head is laying down an adhesive, and that's your powder replacement. So if I open up the machine right now, you'll actually sh- you'll see three staggered print heads, and as the machine passes, you'll see the color, and then you'll see the ink, and then the, the adhesive is a little clear. Um, but there's a couple tests you do to make sure the adhesive is hitting. It goes through a curing unit that's no differently than like a flash to get it tacky. You cut it up, you heat press it on, and, and you're good to go. So, um, yeah, it's it's crazy. Like, it kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, obviously, the technology is still evolving. They're working really hard on it. But um, it's going to erase our – I think we're going to finally get rid of DTG, which I just hate. I hate DTG. Really? Okay, so then that was my next question is where does it fit in with the workflow? And I was going to lean more on all just the fulfillment stuff you do, but is that is it also on the DTG 100%. Side? Worst part of DTG is pre-treat. Pre-treat sucks. Mm-hmm. If you could find someone mm-hmm. in the world that likes pre-treat, info at printavo.com, you're on the show. Pre-treat is awful. There's nothing good about it. Um and you have to get a good pre-treater and it takes a long time. And I just think, you know, like unless you have a really dialed in DTG department and you're working really good machinery and you have a really good process and your pre-treat is really dialed in, having to fire up that machine every other day to do 20 pieces is just a pain in the neck. Um, and, it, you know, like some people will say they really can dial it in. It, it takes a lot of work to dial it in. So... DTG is always like the sore in our shop. No one likes doing it. And for that reason, we try to avoid selling it, right? With direct-to-film, you literally like you pop it in the queue, you hit print, and it just starts running on the reel. You cut it up and heat press it no differently than the names and numbers. Um, so, you know. What does it, what does it run roughly uh, compared to your pre-treated machine oh setup. it's an expensive piece of equipment i mean you're you know um it's gonna be anywhere in the 25 to thirty-five thousand dollar range um if you get mm-hmm. a piece of junk off the internet it might it probably will not work uh one of the reasons we went with cobra flex and like i said we're still testing it uh is because they had texts that came out and um whether it's dave jim chris sean monty these are all guys that are older than me that have been in the industry a long time, and we're just talking nonstop. Hey, what do you think about this? What about that? Um, you know, try this out. Uh, what if I choke this a little bit? How will it work? And to me, that was my biggest fear factor is I will be a guinea pig. I will be patient yeah. zero as long as I know that y'all have my back and we're working through this together. Um, and so for us, there was a spend where I said, okay, if we're spending a couple thousand dollars a month on transfers, um, it's time to, to buy that piece of equipment to reduce that cost and, you know, increase turnaround time. So do you know what the rough cost of, of ink is with this on the paper or maybe it's paper and ink or is it uh, so it's film, it's film of- and ink and, and you're going to pay per, you know, per inch, right. And how much ink you okay. use. Um, there are consumables in it no differently than DTG. You cannot run out of ink, right? Um, and the ink is, is, you know, has to be regularly filled and, and stuff. So um, it's going to reduce the cost 
by multitudes, but it's also going to increase like speed and efficiency. So Got if it. we have orders coming in overnight on our e-commerce sites, um, we can quickly print print it the next day. So it's kind of going back to that you know two second lean just in time manufacturing. We're really trying to close that gap, and that's where the cost savings is going to be. I think. Got it. So it's lower quantity, higher complexity, or multi location plus more fulfillment on demand. You know, maybe more unknown type of uh, uh, of order volume right. stores. Right. And, and when we're running online stores, we don't know how stores are going to do. And you know, when we put up a complicated store, this gives me a little bit more leeway to fulfill lower minimums. So we're not refunding or canceling. And at any given point, we're running. 50 to 60 stores. So we're constantly going in and having to like refund the three shirts that didn't hit minimums or something. So in this case, I could just send it straight to the Cobra Flex and we could just run it and make the customer happy. So um, it's effectively allowing us to do print on demand without getting DTGs. Wow. Okay. We got to send the film crew down, do something cool. Yeah. See It'll be it awesome. Um, I'll be covering it quite a bit. Um, you know, it's it's a pretty great partnership, and I appreciate like Multicraft doing that with me and Cobra Flex. Um, you know, here to help help the industry out. Um, still have my homage to Supercolor and Rum and those guys because they they still crush it for us, and I don't think that's going to go away. Um, but it is going to serve a different purpose in our shop, and we're excited for that. So yeah. So where do you think there's needs for then ordering transfers? Or, or does it? Well, you, know, you have to look at, you know, really you cut. have to look at, okay, I, I'm not a proponent of just going out and buying equipment, right? More autos does not equal more money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when you maximize a certain, you know, when you utilize something to a certain degree, right? When you've got direct to screen and your autos are running one and a half shifts, okay, now it's time to get a piece of equipment. We were just at a point that our spend on transfers was so high that it only made sense, right? It's like the example I, I use is if I took an Uber every single day in Chicago and it was 60 bucks a day, at some point it makes sense to lease a car for $300 a month and pay a $100 parking spot, right? But then you also have to pay for gas and insurance and you know maintaining the car and the tires and all that other stuff. So you know, there's a difference with paying for convenience, which I'm all for, right? Subbing jobs out and, you know, promo orders and, and things like that. But there is a there is a cost associated to that convenience. And I think it was, you know, something that we wanted to strategically bring in-house. So, yeah. That Uber example That's was cool. good. <laughs> that is good. I was going to say. That's really good. Were you thinking about no, that one? Did, Did you write that in the notes? Just, that uh, good. My that little... Was... The wisdom here gave it to me. This, you know, I do have a palette of bobbleheads <laughs> oh boy. that are sitting in our warehouse. I, yeah, I saw that picture. What, what should we do with them? Ship them to Marco. <sighs> if you guys want a bobblehead that I just want to clarify, I did not make. It's but, pretty. Uh, Stephen very meticulously made. I mean, I must say that from the first version. To the last final version, a lot of improvements were made. Continuous improvement. It looks incredible. It's funny because I'll go into so many uh, just random shops, especially when we're trade showing around or, or whatever's going on. And, you know, they're just, they're like little, every, like it could be on somebody's desk or it's on the press going around or it's like hidden somewhere in another room. It is kind of funny. Yeah. A little Easter eggs. Um, I'm going to Easter egg the... Uh, the trade show. We'll save some for Long Beach. Yeah. Maybe uh, maybe we'll bring some to Print Hustlers. Um, did you ever think you were going to be like an ornament like this ever in your life? I did not. And, uh, yeah, still still feels slightly strange, but it, uh, you're, you've cool. got a, you've got a good figure for a bobblehead. I must say, like, I don't think I could pull it off. You <laughs> definitely, you can. Why couldn't you? I don't know. I just it's bad profile. Like it doesn't work, Bruce. You kind of got you got bobblehead vibes. I don't know. (laughs) I don't think anyone would disagree. I don't think anyone would disagree. I think Ryan. You should probably get Ryan Moore. Should probably get a bobblehead. Um, Brett Bowden, great bobblehead. I could see that. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, But you know, 
you just you guys it could be like a collector edition except they were so hard to order i went back and forth so many times um anyways hey i was wondering a separate question if you could hire any role today or promote somebody into a role that that would work really well what role would that be Screen Printing Mag asked this question recently, and I saw it, and I thought this was a pretty interesting question. Well, I would hire a purchaser and scheduler. Who's purchasing now? Oh. <laughs> Source spot. Source spot. Uh, key employee left after uh, three, four years with us, ready to move on to the next journey. I blame the industry for being so hard to purchase, maybe, that they went crazy um, trying to order. Um, no. All things considered, purchasing and scheduling is one of the hardest, most meticulous things because there's so many different ways that things can happen in the shop. And um, we were actually talking about this. Um, we actually just hired for the role, and they're starting in two weeks. But we actually said... Really? Yeah, Congrats. Yeah. How'd you find... Um, went to a neighboring industry in town that handled just purchasing and um just talked to them and and uh was able to hire them but we actually i don't think i'm going to put the role on the production floor i think it's going to be an office job um i think we had it on the production floor because they like need to be by everything and it's all you mean location yeah. wise or payroll wise uh, like or? it's more it's more on the management side right like scheduling is like playing tetris and it needs to be methodical and accurate and it can't just be like, oh, we're just going to do this next, you know. Um, same with purchasing. You can't, I mean, it's so hard to do right now. And so we're really going to define the role um, because it is the funnel, right? You have this big sales funnel that comes in and then you have production and there's such a bottleneck. And if it's not done properly, like bad information is bad shirt. So we're... Uh, we're going to really, really tailor the role um, because if, if that funnel can widen a little bit, it gives us more leeway to, to sell aggressively, right? They are doing both, both posi- or both of those Yeah, it's going to be purchasing and scheduling, right? But it's going to be purchasing for the whole company. It's not going to be like, you, you know, someone orders promo products. Nope, everything is going to get bought through that person. And then I can hold that person accountable for measuring things, right? Like measuring gross profit on every job, right? So they can be more analytical and methodical with their work rather than, oh, production manager, go order the shirts, you know? Mm-hmm. So I'm excited. Um, losing a key employee, we've all been there. What, what was it like for you? Um, I didn't see it coming, probably avoidable. Um, I blame myself a lot of times because, you know, what could I have done better, right? Wow. Um, what, like culture yeah, what could or? I have done better? You know, we, we have, I want to say, like 15 new employees in the last year. And I talked to you about this, Bruce, but, you know, giving everyone your time is really tough. Um, and making sure that leadership is giving them their time. And, you know, as I reflect on it, you know, um, could there have been things I've done better? Could I have checked in with that person more, right? Could I have been better about one-on-ones or performance reviews or really listening more, Right. Um, because when, when someone leaves and they're good, you look at that as like, you know, the, the stubborn boss would be like, they shouldn't have been here anyways. And I've, I've really had to like, be like, no, you know, what could we have done to, to give them to, to never get them to a point to say, I I can't do this anymore. You know? Um, I mean, that's tough, especially at 15. I, are those your all direct reports? or, or is No, there... we're building out middle management, right? And so that's that's another cause of it is, you know, that was not a direct report. That was a, a, a previous direct report of mine, right? Mm-hmm. That was no longer a direct report. And I think that change management is really hard. Um, the way an owner does something, you know, it's almost like we're brotherly, fatherly. We're there for, you know, but it's different when you've got layers of management. Um, it's a lot different. And, uh, that could be one reason is they were no longer my direct report because I, I, I could not do that anymore. Right. And so when someone's your direct report for two years or three years, and then they, they switch, you know, there's a lot that could have, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned from it. Um, 
and and will we be better because of it yeah we'll be stronger we'll we'll, we'll figure it out we'll refine um i think the best advice i got was like you're going to own a company maybe for your life and people are going to come and go that's it you can't expect everyone to retire with you <laughs> Oh, so we've got Tito and Jeanette Hardy actually joining. Uh, we're going to have to continue this conversation, though, Stephen, right after. Because um, there's so many just interesting things that dial in and things that I've, I feel like picked up on, too, on our end. But most importantly, we've got a very, very special set of guests here today. Tito and Jeanette out of Aviant Corporation. Uh, UK, Georgia, Charlotte, a little bit of everywhere. But uh, thank you guys so much for being able to join us today. Thanks for having us. Thank you guys for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. I look forward to talking to you guys. This is uh, definitely a challenging time in the industry. I'm sure when we drop this, shops are going to flood to this and be like, we want to know what's going on. What the heck? Um, But, you know, before we jump into it, um, a little bit of background. How'd you all get into the industry? Tell us a little bit about... uh, about yourselves? Well, I've been with Avian three and a half years now, but I've worked in the screen printing industry for, for much longer than that. Um, most of my experiences with water-based printing before I joined Avian, and I've worked with both CHT out of Germany and Magna Colors out of the UK. Yeah, and I, uh, I'm i still relatively new to the screen printing industry. I joined uh, about six years ago through the Rutland Group. I started there uh, managing the Rutland brands for Latin America. Uh, and then subsequent to that, when Poly One made the acquisition of Rutland Group, I joined uh, Poly One, which is now Avian. So six years of experience in the uh, industry thus far. That's awesome. Um, you know, with such a large company, uh more specifically on the screen printing side, you guys have a very broad reach. Obviously, there's a lot of brands under Aviant now. Um, can you just tell us just a little bit more about that and the role that you guys play? Because it, it's huge. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, well, first of all, I think we have a common goal and all the brands that are underneath us have the common goal of providing the best products that we can uh, to all of our customer base. And if you think about where our customer, customer base resides, Uh, We're fortunate enough to have distributors in over 55 countries. So meeting uh, quality needs across that broad spectrum of uh, of printers that are out there is is always the challenge that we embrace. You know, there are we have many uh, initiatives that are corporate wide, but two that I would really like to point out is, first of all, our Great Places to Work initiative. Uh, We are a certified Great Place to Work, and that really means we spend a lot of time around uh, transparency, you know, particularly in today's uh, times where things are difficult, you know, we're very transparent with our, our employee base on how uh, what's going on in our business. Communication is critical. And uh, and we spend a lot of time to make sure everyone's appreciated in, in, in the work that they perform. And I really think that does translate over into the products that we produce and ultimately provide our market. The other part that I'm very excited about, and I hope we have some time today to talk about, it, is our sustainability initiatives. We're very passionate across the entire corporation to become a more sustainable uh, company, and that's both internal and in the products that we serve. Uh, internally, we're always looking at how we contribute uh, to sustainability issues from a manufacturing point of view, but also from a product point of view. And what we mean by that for, for products is, you know, we're looking for ways from a research and development point of view on how we can help our printers out, you know, whether that means less consumption of ink on a per print basis, uh, reduction of energy cost, which is extremely important. As you guys know, how we can uh, help a printer uh, reduce that energy bill, that monthly bill that you get every month. And um, and looking at the raw material bases that go into that, uh, making sure that they're coming from sustainable resources. So a lot of good work that is a, it's, it's a, it's a benefit to be part of the Avian Corporation. Uh, particularly on that R&D side when we're talking to our suppliers and and working with them to say, hey, how can we better serve our industry? So those relationships with suppliers are extremely important. Uh, again, uh, you know, making sure that we produce quality products that meet a lot of certification needs in different parts of the country, you know, uh, different countries of the world, I should say. So, you know, Jeanette, perhaps you want to talk a little bit more about the certification side of things. I think that's important. Yeah, sure. Um, and just just to go back 
as well, Bruce, to answer a little bit more about your question about, you know, avian specialty inks and how we came about. I think everybody is probably familiar with Poly One being the owner of, of the Wilflex brand of inks. And then, of course, they acquired the Rutland Group portfolio of brands. So that includes Rutland, Union, QCM, and also Print Top, our facility based down in Lima, Peru. And more recently, on the 1st of July this year, we also acquired Magna Colors in the UK. So yes, we've, we've got quite a large portfolio of brands right now. As Tito said, you know, the, the business goal for all those brands is really to provide top quality inks globally. You know, so we do have distribution in 55 countries, but with that global supply comes the global demands. And you're likely familiar with Tosca and CPSIA in the US. Well, all those different countries have very similar demands and we have to ensure that all our inks are globally compliant. So with our supply chain, you know, that again is a huge demand on them because they also have to ensure that our raw materials are globally compliant, um, which just is an additional level of, of um, difficulty when supplies are like an additional check it, yeah so, so that's like how you source everything has to be from different certified vendors or um I, yeah well, it has, all of it has to go and maybe that. right is that, yeah go ahead Farag. what is the hardest country to be compliant with oh that's um that's a challenging question but i would say that the compliance is far more um extensive around europe the European side of things and um, that they have import compliance which is reach compliance and then there's also additional certifications that we need to provide uh, really more for the retailers in the, in that area in Europe so so another way that we service our customers and differentiate ourselves is by providing external certifications so one of those would be eco passport which is something that European printers would be extremely familiar with because they're asked for that, to provide that passport to their retailers all the time to ensure that those that our inks are compliant. Um, it's probably not so familiar within the US, but it's definitely something that we get asked for a lot globally. Does that, I'm assuming, have a, a unique effect on the supply chain? woes and just everything that happens because of the limited amount of vendors that you can work with in that certification process? It, it absolutely has thrown another kind of level of uh, complexity in, in the challenging world that we're all living in. So, um, you know, we are committed to our compliance certificates and, and been being and providing the quality ink that the market expects and has, has expected, you know, become accustomed to with every brand that we serve, that we provide over many years. So, um, in today's world with the supply chain challenges that we have, it, you know, it, it's just not a go out into the market and find whatever type of, uh, of a supplier that has something that's close. So luckily, because of our, our relative uh, position in the market and, and who we are, we have very good relationships with our raw material suppliers and we're constantly working on, with them um, to, to educate them on what we need and, and them to educate us back on what we can what we can use. I think what's also interesting that that shops learn about is, you know, I've got Rutland on my shelf, Union on my shelf, and Wilflex, and they're all all made by Aviant. Um, is there ever a thought that they're going to consolidate, or do you do you run each one of them kind of like their own flavor, if you will? No, that's a great question. I get asked that quite a bit, and and, and keep in mind we have distribution partners that are very much. Uh, um, very adamant and, and towards the brand that they have served and many most of our distributors have served those brands for many years so that's something we respect greatly um the the brands have a history they have a uh, a level of trust and following amongst printers so that's something that we uh we cherish uh we don't take that lightly um and and it's um you know something we have to continuously challenge ourselves and make sure we understand what each brand means uh, to a printer, what are those characteristics that they expect and, and provide, you know, how do those products provide value? Particularly the color systems, I'll, I'll be very quick to point out, color systems are, are, are like gold to a certain degree. Uh, they, 
you know, we understand how much time and effort a printer puts into maintaining their color system and particularly the one that they're uh, accustomed to using. So with all the supply chain issues, we're making sure that we continue to provide color to the best extent that we can. And, uh, you know, from a product harmonization, you know, I think when people get concerned, it's, it's along those lines. And that's something we really much uh, value and understand the value to our printers. Gotcha. That's super interesting. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There's shops that are like, I, I swear by this ink, you know. Um, so I guess, you know, we'd love to kind of get into it a little bit and ask, ask you know, some of the nitty gritty. Obviously, shops really want to know what's going on with ink, what's going on with ink. We interviewed um, Chris Blakesley from CEO of Bella, and he kind of walked us through where it all started. Like, what was the first domino to drop and why, you know, that ripple effect has got us where we're at today. Um, obviously, COVID, you know, was was, was one re- big reason. But is there any, any specifics you get into and in where that domino first dropped that it really started to, to hurt the supply chain? Well, I think it's, it's difficult to say which one domino really started everything, but certainly I think the, the instigator of everything was, was the pandemic. And, and, you know, it, it, we've been living that for, for well over a year now, and I think people uh, become a little bit uh, wary of hearing that, and, and, but it, is, it was the first drop. And if you think about specific to our industry, you know, it's, it, was a, it was a sudden stop in, in screen printing. Uh, many shops became, if you think about the very early days in March and April of the pandemic, where businesses were being considered uh, unessential or essential and having to go through that process. So we certainly saw a stop in demand for screen printing across the board. Um, and as it kind of relates to our raw material base, I mean, we, I don't think screen printing was unique in that regard. I think there were a lot of questions on where does the economy go from here in March and April. So it put an immediate, an immediate strain on supplies. Then you couple that with all the logistical issues that are out there uh, labor shortages that are out there, things that are not unique to ink, but across the board. There, we've been unfortunate with some weather events that have happened across the uh, the Gulf Coast that uh, where we see a concentration of a lot of chemical manufacturing. Um, it's been, I would say, almost a bit of a perfect storm. So, um, you know, it's it's not only ink. Uh, I think when, when everyone goes out to, whether it be a, a retail outlet or, or a supermarket, you're seeing empty spots on shelves. It is certainly a global phenomenon that, unfortunately, we're not immune to at this point. Started with toilet paper. <laughs> Started with toilet paper. Um, that was that was almost that was a long time ago. That's super interesting. Um, that that's super interesting, and it's it's you know we're dealing with it with blank goods, and you know even even getting you know foam cups right now. You can't get foam cups and things like that. Do you see us? on the other side of it yet or do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better you you know that's a great question i get asked that often and you know in the beginning this probably we've been living under this this challenging environment for almost a year now and and i I was i was quick to say you know anywhere three to six months to to be honest i pretty much quit guessing uh i read articles uh looking you know looking for sources of information and, um, you know, while we seem to be making progress globally uh, around the pandemic and, and the, the health side of things, you know, there, there are labor shortages, uh, both on the, uh, in the U.S. for manufacturing. Uh, there, are, there are supply chain um, issues, both from an from a ocean container type of uh, point of view and inland trucking. There's a trucker shortage. I'm not sure how all that gets rectified. You know, and I'm not sure really, I haven't seen any anyone bold enough to, to predict this will be over at this point. What I can tell you is that we, we have learned a lot internally through having gone through this. I, I will tell you that we're very proud of, first of all, our operations teams. You know, we have been, we have been challenged on the labor front and, and we're getting through that through a lot of initiatives to make sure that we have people uh, present to, to do the manufacturing that we need. Again, I'm very cognizant that our industry has rebounded greatly in 2021 versus 2020. And uh, it's, it's, it's difficult for people to not be able to get the ink when the orders are coming in. But our operations team has done a, a tremendous job in terms of uh, dedication coming in uh, on weekends for, for more than six months now, pretty much every weekend. You know, I'm very proud of our operations teams. Our R&D team, similarly, we have learned to be flexible to an extent that we've never had to be flexible. 
Um, and, you know, maintaining that flexibility with the raw materials that are afforded to us while continuing to produce very good products, excellent products, has been a challenge. So when we do come out of this, I know we'll be in a much better space. I think we'll, I, I know we'll come out much stronger as an organization. So however, however much time uh, that lasts, uh, we're, we're prepared to get through. We're dedicated to the industry. And, and again, uh, you know, you know this, the sun will come out at some point. And uh, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Is there anything that you, Tito, on your end, more specifically future-proofed or thought about, wow, we should do that differently in case we have uh, very different supply chain challenges in the future too? Well, I think it's just maintaining the flexibility of having multiple um, formulations that, again, accomplishes the, the product features that a printer needs. Uh, that is something that has been a good learning for us. Uh, just, um, you know, not, you know, the, the whole having all of your eggs in one, one basket. So in terms of raw material supplies. So I think we've done a great job with that. Um, again, with, with limited ability to, to source, uh, things from, from places that we haven't been at, you know, we haven't maybe purchased for in the past. Uh, but I would tell you that the R and D team has done a great job of, uh, of, of understanding, hey, if this happens, this is what we can do, or if that happens, this is what we can do. I, I often call it internally our, our Rubik's cube of formulations, and you know, again, we're we're very well positioned coming out of this, and, and it's just driven some some innovation that you know we just felt like we never had to do prior to this. So let me ask. Um, obviously, there's a lot of different types of ink that we buy. Some shops are strictly water based. Um, some are plastisol, some are a hybrid of both. I know that white ink, there's, you know, elements of white ink that maybe make it more difficult or maybe, maybe that's incorrect. Can you talk about, you know, any specifics that are a little harder than others? Like, is it, you know, is, is there any t specific type and maybe that helps us shops to sell it less? No, from a manufacturing, I don't, I don't know if there's anything more specific. I think our challenges really uh, are around. Um, the certification process that uh, Jeanette had mentioned prior to that, uh, from a allocation point of view, you know, we are getting allocated. So I do think it's important that all the shops understand that we're very much uh, concentrated. We've had to put products on suspension. Unfortunately, we've looked at our tail of products that maybe aren't, uh, you know, the high movers. Um, but, you know, we do want to make sure that color systems are, are available our bases that accompany those color systems are available. And, and certainly the whites would come directly right after that. So, um, you know, I think it's, it's not necessarily a manufacturing question. It's maybe perhaps more of a design question um, and, and recycling your ink and those types of initiatives. You know, perhaps Jeanette, you could kind of get into that a little bit more. You know, there are a number of initiatives that we've pointed out that printers can help with uh, to kind of help us all get through the challenges that we're facing today. Yeah, as Tito said, we are focusing on colour systems, um, whites, bleed blockers, you know, trying to get printers the um, key components that they use day to day. Um, and that's where we're focusing our attentions and using up the raw material allocation that we do have. But we do have customer support uh, functions in place, you know, um, you you may be familiar with our IMS software. And I think people just assume that that is just there to provide Pantone formulations for um, the brands that, that we have. Well, that's not necessarily the case because actually it's IMS stands for ink management software. So it's a full software solution to manage your ink room. So not only can you obtain your Pantone formulation, but it also has tools in the software to manage your inventory in the ink room. So your stock levels and your reorder levels, uh, monitor the usage of the ink. But more importantly, right now, when inks at a premium, we all go into shops and they've all got shelves full of ink. Steve, you said yourself, you've got Rutland Union and Wilflex on your shelves. Well, in our IMS software, we have a recycling feature for all of those um, brands. So you can go in there, you've got, a, you find a, a Pantone on your shelf and you can, you want to make another color, well, you can look at how you can make that with those inks that are already on your shelf. So that's a really excellent tool. And I think it's really underused. People don't recognize um, that it's actually 
within the software um, but it's, it's something you know that really sets us apart from other manufacturers because um, it's not available from from everybody else we have done a couple of Facebook lives on that recently so I would really encourage people to go out and look at that and, and use up the inventory that they've already got on the shelf yeah, I mean, using what you have and, and when times get tough, like that's what shops just have to do. Where white ink is more expensive. If you've got to flash a job, it's more expensive. If you'd like darker ink on light garments, we're going to give you a deal. And I think shops should really consider that because it'll it'll make your white ink last longer um, till we're on the other end of it. Uh, it's really interesting to see shops that really dial in their ink rooms and, and then there's shops that are just very wasteful where they're just buying excessive buckets and, and that waste doesn't help anyone for sure. Are there things that you're doing, Stephen, on the, on the waste side or, or recycling side or that you've changed? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are trying to use like, um, discharge under base more with plastic, plast like plastisol on top as a means of using less white, um, thinning down some opportunities where we don't need really a ton of ink on things. Um, but really trying to like expand the extend the lifespan on it, and more importantly, when we're selling a job, making sure that a customer doesn't want an eight by ten glob of a design, um, because that's really what eats it up. It re it's crazy when you have, you know, Jed, my business partner, says, "Why are we using one tens? These should be one sixties. Let's save our ink that we've got." And so there are so many small things you can do to like double the lifespan. Um, and extend that in your shop. And it's, it, it's incremental, but like it makes huge differences. Um, and those are just a few. I don't know. Tito, do you have anything else? No, I think you hit it right on the head. It's, 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 it's really uh, looking how you manage your printing process. It's, it's, it's a deposit of ink at the end, end of the day. And anything you can do to conserve that is extremely important. And I think the IMS, the color software that uh, we're able to, to, to provide for our brands is extremely important. Yeah. Just to that point, though, on, you know, the, the screen mesh and the, the ink deposit. And um, there is a tool, again, in IMS where you can actually calculate the amount of ink that um, a print's going to use. Um, so you can input the, the mesh counts, the um, size of the image, and it will actually calculate the consumption. So, of course, you can play around with those mesh counts and work out which is going to be the most efficient mesh count for that job. That's super cool. I did not Do know that. Do you use that? We don't. Oh. We don't. Hmm. That's awesome. We'll have to check that out. It's interesting thinking about the hoarding aspect, right? Because you could see, obviously, people get scared if their order capacity is limited and thinking, oh, shoot, if it keeps going, I just literally can't fulfill orders, especially through the holiday, you know, a peak time coming up here. I mean, Bruce, I have a picture of you buying toilet paper last March. All right. So <laughs> that wasn't because of the pandemic. I was actually out of toilet paper in my house, which <laughs> did actually, I was a bit worried because I went to three stores and I could not find just the smallest roll of anything. But, but isn't that the same <laughs> thing when Avian, when, when all the companies came out and said, hey, we're going to have to be smart about this and we're going to have to allocate the floodgates opened and I tried to buy as much white ink as I could because you know, and, and, you know i'm glad you guys brought that up it, it, it definitely happened uh, there was a period of time where our our incoming sales orders you know were were abnormal <laughs> you know to say the least in terms of how much ink was being ordered so you're absolutely right it's human nature and, and it's, it's difficult to blame anyone for that but you know obviously i think common sense prevails if, if everybody does that then it just it's just putting a greater strain in the entire network so yeah, to the extent that everybody can, please don't do that. I understand that uh, why you want to do it, but at the end of the day, it's uh, it, it's really not helping the industry very much. So uh, I'm glad, and we do call it. We 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 use the same phrase. It's the toilet paper syndrome. We certainly have witnessed that. So um, we're we're going to get through it all together here. Uh, you know, there will be this will uh, subside at some point, and, and trust us, we're doing everything we can to help everyone get through it. My wife got the worst picture of me that she clearly sent around of like carrying out this, you know, four pack or whatever of toilet paper at night. <laughs> I couldn't believe how many stores they had to go to just to find a little bit. But 
Oh my gosh. Um, what's what's next for Avian on you guys' end? You know, and specifically on the screen printing side. Well, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, um, the sustainability initiatives that we have, we're really excited about. You know, we, we just made the recent acquisition of the Magna Group um, here recently in July, and we're very happy to have that brand underneath uh, the Avian Specialty Inc.'s uh, suite, of, suite of brands. Um, so we're really in a great position to uh, provide a printer you know, whatever solution you might need, whatever whatever that technology might be, we, we run the full suite of, of products, whether it be plastisol, PVC-free, silicone inks, and, and, and with water base, uh, with our two brands, with, with both uh, our Zodiac Aquarius and, and now the Magna brand. So um, it's, it's all about sustainability for us, I think, at this point. You know, we want to be able to, to help this industry go forward and, and become more sustainable. Um, and, and really when we talk about, you know, what's, what does tomorrow look like, that's really where we're focusing our efforts. You know, at this point, it's, it's been a very difficult year to launch products, unfortunately. Um, and then we have a lot of things in the kitty that are ready to go, but given the, the environment that we're living in, you know, adding more products to our portfolio just doesn't quite make sense, but that day will come. And, and when it does, you know, we're, we're very excited about those things that are coming down the, the pipeline. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. We really appreciate the time. I know uh, uh, going through and, and being able to schedule time and all that other stuff is tricky, but it's been it's been really great. And you know, honestly, I think a lot of shops just appreciate that being able to talk to somebody to to see higher up that can truly understand what's going on and and what we have to look forward to is exciting. So. Tito Jeanette, thank you guys. This is the Avian Corporation. Thank you guys again for listening to another episode of Pronouncers Podcast. I'm Bruce from Printavo, your host. Got Stephen Ferry from Campus Inc. We'll see you guys in the next one.